teachers work incredibly hard. It's one of the only jobs where you just, you don't stop. You continue in the evening, you continue at the weekends. The English department group, the essence of that is getting people together, creating that community, talking to others, um, I suppose being a bit nosy, seeing what other people are doing, how other people are teaching. So that thread has almost continued all the way through, um, but it's benefited me in many ways. My subject lends itself to that so well, because I think when you're studying English, you're not just studying reading and writing, you're studying philosophy, you're studying psychology of human behaviour, you're studying society. Um, there's just so much going on in the reading of one text and the dissection of one text that it's just an incredible subject. It frustrates me slightly that on social media in particular, I feel anybody can call themselves a tutor, whereas I think there's a certain skill set required for tutoring and knowledge and, and experience. Hello and welcome to the Qualified Tutor podcast, the podcast that brings you the latest in the world of tutoring, edtech and education and, hopefully, inspires in you the big change that each and every one of us is capable of. Qualified Tutor is an industry-leading tutor training organisation and online tutoring community for thousands of tutors around the world. This podcast is the voice of this community, where we aim to hear from tutors, teachers, entrepreneurs, coaches, business experts, students, tutorpreneurs, and more from the world of tutoring about what inspires them every day, how they can help tutors like you, and what they've learnt about tutoring along the way. The question is, what will you learn today? Hello and welcome to the 145th episode of the Qualified Tutor podcast. My name is Ludo Miller, the host of this podcast. Welcome back to our regular listeners. Welcome to any of you for whom this is your first time listening to the Qualified Tutor podcast and a very, very warm welcome to our guest today, Mira Vasudeva. Mira, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Lido. I'm very excited to be here. And I'm equally excited to have you on. We met uh, recently for the first time at the National Tutors Conference in London, which was um, a really lovely event. It's great to meet so many other people in the UK tutoring industry, um, plenty of people whose faces you'd only ever seen on a, on a Zoom screen before. So um, very lovely to, to meet people in person. There's been a few episodes recently of, of, of people I met um, during that conference. So uh, it was obviously a very productive time. I hope you enjoyed it as well, Mira. It was um, incredible. I'm so excited to have actually been because last year I remember it being advertised. I think it was online last year. But I think I remember being at school and not being able to attend. So it was wonderful to finally go this year. And I met so many fabulous people. So it was a great opportunity to network. And I'm really looking forward to next year's already. Yeah, exactly. You booked time off. You popped it in the diary. Um, big props to the, the Tutors Association for organising a um, great, great conference. Um, but Mira, um, for those of you listeners who, who haven't come across Mira before, then um, you need to get into your Facebook groups and you need to understand uh, your English tutoring a little bit better because um, as a little background to Mira, just before we, we dive in here, um, Mira has been a, a private tutor of, of English um, for a almost you know around about uh, 14 15 years now um and and was also a GCSE English examiner for for um over uh, nine years now head of English at a school in London for, for around about 10 years as well so mixing those three roles um really as so many teachers do um but the bit that really uh, allows Mira to stand out and, and one of the angles that we want to come uh, at this conversation from today is that Mira has been uh, the admin and leader of a, of a massive and, and hugely influential uh, English teachers Facebook group. It's got over, I think, is it 24,000 members now, Mira? Um, we've got over 24,000 registered users on the website and the Facebook group itself, as not everyone has Facebook for various reasons, we've got over 8,000 and it's incredibly active. Yeah. Okay. Well, the link to that will be in the show notes as it always is. Um, and hopefully after the next 25 minutes or so, you will be convinced to join that group and to dive into to all that uh, Mira and that group have, have to offer. But before we do any of that, Mira, I'd love to ask, 
what is giving you reason to smile today, Thursday the 8th of December? Um, I suppose, gosh, I'm trying to think what gives me a reason to smile today. It's just great to be invited here, Ludo, if I'm honest. Um, I was very close to declining your very kind invitation (laughs) to be on your show. So I'm completely coming out of my comfort zone. And I suppose I feel quite proud of myself for doing that. Um, I was cajoled into doing this by my partner. And um, yeah, it's a new experience for me completely. So that in itself is growth. Yeah, well, I've always been very proud on this podcast to give certain guests their first podcast experience. And, and I think that is that's hugely important because this podcast and this this audience is about, you know, small business, small education business growth and, and you know, doing a podcast, doing a blog, you know, doing your first live workshop or, you know, event at a festival. That is all part of it. Um, so, yeah, there's there's so much for you to add, though, um, Mira. Now, uh, regular listeners will remember and will know that we like to come at these conversations first from uh, the school days angle, looking back to those days when our guests were, were, were at school, were tiny terrors or, were, you know, front of the class nerds, whatever it was. Um, now, I know that you've had a busy couple of weeks, Mira. Um, Mira's actually joining us from uh, India, where she's uh, attending a, a wedding next week. It's normally based in London in the UK. So a bit of traveling around, documents flying about here and there. You weren't able to find any school reports or you were able to find them, but not, you know, um, bring them to the, to the conversation. But you do have a bit of a memory about, you know, the trend, the pattern, the thread of school feedback when uh, when all those years ago. Is that right? I do. I do. I think it's always been a bit of a joke in the family that I've always um, had reports that probably, I mean, I don't think I was a tiny terror. Definitely not. And I definitely wasn't front of the class nerd either. either. <laughs> I, think I was somewhere in the middle. Um, but what I was is one of those kids who talk a lot. So there was always a thread of Mira's really good However, she needs to focus on her work more because she's a little too chatty. So I think I've just always been really friendly, wanting to talk to people, wanting to talk to the person next to me, getting distracted in that manner. And yeah, so that's always been a thread of me just being a bit of a chatterbox. Yeah, I mean, I guess that is a, it's a nice, easy thing for teachers to pick up on, isn't it? You know, without needing to go too deep into, you know, how what your attainment's been like. It's like, oh, okay, Miresh, oh, I always recall her. She was chatting at the front of the class. I wonder where that came from then. Do you think that was just, you are very much a people person, you love to talk to others, or do you think that class actually bored you a little bit? Um, that's a really interesting question. I actually think I come from a massive family and there's always people around. And so I think it's more of a kind of you have lots of siblings and you're talking to everybody and then you're in a classroom and you just want to continue talking to everybody. Mm-hmm. And I suppose that's translated in that sense of kind of family and community. So, for example, the English department group, the essence of that is getting people together, creating that community, talking to others. Um, I suppose being a bit nosy, seeing what other people are doing, how other people are teaching so that thread has almost continued all the way through and um, that it's benefited me in many ways yeah that nosiness seeing what maybe a classmate's <laughs> test scores were oh did you oh, okay no you didn't get as, oh okay as good as I'll me. take that way and I'll do it better <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly it's yeah. a sort of constant you know comparison um so do you think you know that's the, the way that you naturally were as, as a child and, and had been you know, almost forced to be by the big family that you'd grown up in. Do you think that that sense of reaching out to people, always connecting, always chatting, always getting to know people, do you think that is the real ethos of the English leaders group? Do you think that's why you started this group? I think that's supportive nature, definitely. I mean, if we're going to perhaps look at it on that type of psychological level of going back to your childhood and what happened there, that then leads to your present. I suppose my parents are also foster carers. So for that reason, I've had a large family. I mean, I've met children from all walks of life who have had many situations, disabilities, really hard times, and you never really know what people are going through. And so the essence of the English department Facebook group, it's just to be supportive. Our culture, our ethos, it's to support one another. I mean, teachers are burnt out, teachers are tired, um, and it's just about sharing. And it's about building that community together. It's about giving people time back. Teachers go home and they're tired. And if it means I share a resource which allows somebody else to just spend time with their family or just have dinner or have a bit of peace and quiet and do nothing, 
because teachers continue. Teachers work incredibly hard. It's one of the only jobs where you just, you don't stop. You continue in the evening, you continue at the weekends. And it's a really sad state, if I'm honest. And so the ethos of the group it is to just give back, to share. It's completely free. Um, I don't make a penny from the group. And so if anything, I put a lot into it. So it's quite selfless in that manner. Um, I think some people buy me the odd coffee here and there, which is really lovely. And it goes back into just the website because it does cost money to run. However, it is just about helping one another. Yeah, that is a a truly lovely way of putting it, Mira. Um, And do you think that same selfless ethos is your why behind you know the tutoring that you do because obviously you know you have been a teacher you've been a head of English but but you've also been a private tutor for a number of years as well is that kind of the same or is there a different angle there? Um, I I think it all just amalgamates if I'm honest I think I can't put it down to one specific why I think there are lots of little whys that make up my big why of what I do what I do so I think um for myself when I was a child I think one of my big whys are being the person that a child needs when they are a child. I don't think I had that. I went to a non-selective state school. Um, It was down the bottom of my road. I don't think my parents knew any better. Um, It was none of this kind of let's search for the best grammar school. Let's let's try and get her into a private school. Firstly, we wouldn't have even had the money to send me to a private school. I've always been very envious of children who have kind of attended private schools because I think some of the opportunities have been incredible. I mean, I can't play an instrument. I almost feel as though if I went to a better school, that could be something I may have learnt. Um, And so I thought I went to a very ordinary school. And I think it's unfair that the knowledge you get in an ordinary state school may sometimes be different to somebody who goes to a private school and they have greater knowledge at hand. So I feel as though if I had someone like myself when I was, say, 15 or 16, I think I could have possibly done a little bit better. I don't think I did bad, um, far from it, but I think life could have been a little bit different And so I think it's so important to have that knowledge, that guidance, that person just giving you direction. I think so many teenagers are directionists when it comes to exams and studying and how do you even revise and how do you put timetables together? How do you revise effectively? How do you remember things? And so I think one of the whys is that I know I could give children a lot of guidance. Um, I suppose that's one of my whys. Another one is just passion for my subject. I absolutely love teaching English. I love poetry. I love reading books. I think in this day and age where it's a battle with technology and children are constantly on their phones or Netflix and there's a million things they could be doing. Why would they pick up a book? So they need that guidance again that a book is beautiful, poetry is wonderful, on a rainy day, on a sunny day. Um, So really to inspire children to find the joy in English, because I do believe English is a subject for life. It's not only for exams. And that's my ethos. I make very clear to students because it's all around you. It's in politics. It's in supermarkets when you walk around and um, effective persuasive language. It's in politics when politicians are giving speeches, for example. So it's literally all around them. Um, So I do want them to enjoy the subject. I want them to see the relevance in real life, that to be able to communicate effectively, it's a skill for life. It's not just for your examination. That is, if you give that spiel at the start of every first session you have with a a client, (laughs) then then they'll be hooked in for years, Mira. That is... um, the, that's a very that was almost like a, a politician's rousing speech actually <laughs> funny that you ended uh you ended on that touch there but no you're, you're very right the the relevance of um these areas the relevance of, of you know confidence and being able to speak well and, and and you know speak confidently and speak fluently is is yeah cannot be understated um and i do think that uh being a good tutor is often about having confidence as the tutor but actually, more than that, you are exuding that confidence, or at least you're showing the, the child that um, ways to be confident. But also, look, I'm going through this journey of trying to become more confident. So let's do this together. Let's share in that journey. That that that's that almost that that striving to become. Um, more I think confident. it's really about 
educating the whole child as well. And I think my subject lends itself to that so well, because I think when you're studying English, you're not just studying reading and writing, you're studying philosophy, you're studying psychology of human behaviour, you're studying society. Um, There's just so much going on in the reading of one text and the dissection of one text that it's just an incredible subject. You're teaching them empathy because they get to look at character situations and morals and you get to explore that and discuss that and put yourself in those situations. So technically, you're making better human beings. You're sending off kinder souls into society. And if I could do that, that's incredible. What another lovely way of putting it. Thanks to episode sponsors, The Tutor Index. Hi there, I'm Chris, co-founder of The Tutor Index. It's incredibly exciting to be sponsoring this episode of the Qualified Tutor Podcast. Whether you're just starting out or have been tutoring for a number of years, the Tutor Index provides a great platform to promote yourself to new and existing clients and allows you to teach how you want, when you want. Best of all, we charge zero commission or finder's fees, meaning you keep more of what you earn. So sign up today for your free profile at thetutorindex.com. So, I mean, in your experience, Mira, what makes a good, you know, brackets, English tutor? Um, So I would say to start with knowledge. I think knowledge is crucial as a teacher because as a teacher or a tutor, but more specifically as a tutor, because you're giving that additional support. You're trying to add value to a child's life. You're trying to add value to their exam grades and teach them for success. Um, So knowledge is really important. But I think something that's really important is building relationships. So when I was in school, when I was teaching in school full time, I would often say to my children, I see you more than I see anybody I live with at home. And so we will get on. We will enjoy this time we have together because I see you the most out of everybody in the week. We (laughs) spend four or five hours in a week together. That is an awful lot of time. And I'd say to them, you speak to me more than you probably speak to your parents at home. So I do think building relationships and recognising that children are not robots. You can't just bring them into a room or have them on screen and all of a sudden instantly just start teaching. It's not going to work. I think it's really important to develop that relationship to get to know them as human beings is crucial to get to know their likes, their dislikes and what they're like. So you could tailor your their learning to that is really important. Um, but I think that's crucial as well. So a mix of knowledge, experience, skill of how to teach, because having the knowledge isn't enough. So how do you communicate that knowledge to students? That's crucial. And how do you enthuse students as well? So many switch off, whether it's face to face or behind a screen. So I think part of getting to know them and building that relationship, it's finding things that you know may interest them. So whether it's a story or a poem on a topic they like or something they could relate to is really important yeah that final that final point is is massive isn't it um making it relatable to the real world and and you've just spoken about earlier about how relevant english is to the real world so actually that link there is almost you know self-perpetuating um but you know making also you know making things relevant to the real world will be engaging you know children you know they children love to learn that's without a doubt but also they love to keep up with the latest you know trends or fads or you know you know topical uh concepts so um yeah if you're able to relate that to a piece of news or you know a recent invention or a recent creation or a recent discovery or something for example in science then um Mm -hmm. then you're well on the way to making the entire session more interesting you know it's walking away going, oh, I absolutely loved that session with, 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 uh, you know, Miss Vasudeva or, or Mira or, you know, whatever it is, going back to their parents, you know, ranting and raving about how great it was that Mira let them watch a YouTube video or something. Anyway, it would be instructional, of course. Think, yeah. And these things <laughs> stay with life, don't they? I mean, I remember great stories I read and I love passing that on to my students. One of my favorite stories as a child. And I imagine I must have read it. I don't remember exactly which year group. I imagine it could have been year six. And it's still one of my favourite stories and I love teaching it is Land the Slaughter by Roald Dahl and if there's anyone in the audience or listening who's not familiar with 
it, go away and read it. It's a great story. It's not only for children, it's for adults too. So (laughs) things like that, they stay with them for life. Students don't realise how wonderful reading is. And that actually, if you put away your, um, your phone, you could have so much fun reading. I think that's one of the most exciting, most enticing little snippets. It's not only for kids, it's for adults too. Absolutely. That is that should be the mantra of our community, actually. Because it creates the culture though. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we're all little kids inside. We all want to, you know, read the most exciting story or you know, learn and you know, learn a, an exciting moral lesson or whatever it is. You know, mm. um, I love that phrase. It's not just for kids, it's for adults too. Um so you know, you you've You've been a tutor, you've been a teacher alongside that for, for many years. And, you know, lots and lots of our audience will also have done the same, um, either simultaneously or, you know, maybe moved to tutoring after teaching. What skills do you think you learned as a teacher that you were then able to take into your tutoring? Okay, gosh, where do I start? I think everything I've learned as a teacher, really, is really <laughs> I mean, I, I suppose the only thing that isn't is the surplus data I've had to deal with. That's probably the only thing I find irrelevant, apart from that literally <laughs> every other part of the job has been relevant. So in a classroom, you're dealing with 30 personalities, and that's only one class. And then if you times that by four or five classes, you're teaching in a week. And my maths is atrocious, so I won't even try and work that out. <laughs> um, I'm not as strong in maths, I must say. And so you've got these 30 different students that you're dealing with and when it comes to tutoring you're dealing with one child or possibly a small group so I suppose empathy has been a big thing because I've learned about different types of students I've met students from different cultures different walks of life so I think empathy has been really useful on a personal level patience when you're dealing with 30 different children you have to have the patience um, and just to be able to teach teach and treat each child as an individual that's been really important um every child has had different needs so building that relationship has been crucial and I've definitely taken that into tutoring and the difference with tutoring is it could be more personalized than in a classroom so in a classroom you're forced to kind of deal with all 30 students and there needs to be some some level of kind of dealing with all 30 of them at the same time but in tutoring you're allowed to give more personalized um, you're allowed to have a more personalized relationship with a child but I think on another level just the knowledge and the experience so if we look at things I've had to do as head of department where it comes to sequencing of the curriculum when I tutor I'm not just teaching one lesson in isolation I'm teaching a series of lessons that I've planned so there's a connection there's a thread of knowledge and skills that I'm building on and I've learned this through my teaching practice from creating a curriculum for the whole school from all the way down to key stage three to six form that there has to be a thread of knowledge and skills and building upon prior knowledge so that's been really really important sequencing of um, knowledge and lessons I think examiner training has been really important as well so as an examiner um teaching and examining I think professionally that has benefited me massively for tutoring I feel I am so much more confident with my subject I know what examiners are looking for and I always say to students at the end of the day as an examiner all we have is a mark scheme in front of us so it's really important for students to understand the mark scheme and for us to dissect the mark scheme and for them to understand nuances of the mark scheme which I'm able to teach because of my examiner training so I think that's crucial um I've also as an examiner and a teacher I've been able to look at a range of abilities and scripts That means I'm able to recognise frequent errors and I'm able to teach towards those frequent errors. I still allow students to make them because I think making those errors is incredibly important. So I think I pre, um, I kind of preempt the errors they're going to make. I even have it on my PowerPoint slide. I'll give them a task to do. And on the next slide, Um, it's almost like magic. I say to them, I know you're going to probably make at least three or four of these 10 errors. And they do. And they wonder how I know. And I say, this is what you call knowledge and experience. So I think that's been really valuable. Yeah. What a wonderful list of of skills, transferable skills there. And and actually, if you are uh, someone listening who has been a teacher who's either thinking about moving into tutoring or has just moved into tutoring, then it is it's such a logical step precisely for those reasons that Mary's just laid out 
the skills that are transferable are almost ubiquitous apart from maybe the data handling and the and the behavior management side of it um and, and skills that you maybe didn't even think that, that that would be relevant you know really coming to the fore so um thank you so much for, for laying those out and now a brief word from last week's guest roshan darianani whose episode you can catch after this By being on the podcast, I learned that there is a community of tutors who, in Ludo's words, speak the same language and have the same aspirations for their students. That was great to learn because working as a tutor can sometimes be a bit isolating. What I enjoyed most about it is that Ludo is a very relaxed and empathetic host. He made the time go by very quickly. I would say to future guests that being on the podcast is fun. It helps you reflect on your own experience and share what you've learned so that others can benefit. We've just got a couple of questions left, actually. Um, the final one will be about looking ahead to, to kind of what's next for you, Mira. But, um, and this almost seems like such a big topic to try and, you know, squeeze in at the end of a podcast. But I, I, I did want to ask you this because of your positioning in, in both the school environment and the tutoring environment. Um, and the, the, the question is fairly blunt, but I'm just going to ask it anyway. Do schools need tutors? And if so, what can be done to improve the links between the two? I think it's a really difficult question to answer, if I'm honest. So yep. I think something we have to be aware of in a post-COVID climate, kids have missed out on learning. So I think rather than having a divide between us and them, I don't think there should be a divide, but I'm aware of conversations. I'm aware I've kind of witnessed conversations both online and offline where there seems to be some hostility towards tutors from class teachers. Um, I think there's a range of reasons why. I think some teachers feel it's burdening them when they get contacted by tutors and it becomes another stressor because it's another email. It's another person to be accountable to or to answer an email and give work to or just respond. So I think that's an issue. Um, There seems to be, yeah, there just seems to be a bit of a divide. And I think what we need to work really hard to do is to close that divide. And I think because there is possibly a tiny bit of conflict between class teachers and tutors outside, I think the best way to solve conflict of any sort always is communication. So I think increasing the communication between class teachers and tutors, because at the end of the day, we're working for the same cause, and that's student success. We all want the same thing. We want students to succeed. So I think being a bit more selfless and thinking about students, that's really important. So if we're working in partnership with teachers, sorry, with tutors, then I think we just need to think about the bigger picture. Why are we doing this? We're doing this because we want the child we are teaching to succeed and to do better. We're on the same side. And that's really important to recognise. Yeah, absolutely. Vera. So do schools need tutors? I would say... Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. I'm going to hold you to that. I'm not allowed to sit on the fence. I will I say yes. That's probably the democratic answer. But no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I am, I am joking. The, 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 the real answer is, is what you're saying there is, is the, um, you know, the, the blurring of the lines between the two and, and not setting up a them and us, um, you know, Absolutely. Dichotomy. And I think we need to recognise that teachers work incredibly hard. I've been there. I've done that in a classroom and we can't do it all. So I think we need to see it as a helping hand, a little bit of support for us and the child. Yeah. Yeah. Mira, we are almost at a a close here, Um, but we wouldn't want to finish without looking ahead to the future and without setting up what you are going to be looking ahead to, you know, the rest of this year and, and coming into 2023 so that our listeners can follow that journey and, and can be part of it. So what is next for you? What's next for Mira Vasudeva? Um, gosh, there's a range of things. It's all very exciting. I don't know where to start. So um, I think first and foremost, I'm a teacher. 
And that's something people need to recognise. I recently gave up my job. So I was working in a wonderful school. It was incredibly difficult to leave because I loved my school. I loved the children. I loved my team. I loved the staff. So it was a really difficult decision to walk away. And I did. And I did it so that I could develop and grow my own tutoring business, which seemed to um, take off really well. I've been tutoring for over 10 years or so. So I've been tutoring just as long as how I've been teaching. Um, And so I walked away in July and I'm only just finding my feet and starting to grow. I'm learning a lot. So I think the year ahead, because I am only a teacher, um, I've never had to deal with things like accounts and branding and social media in those ways. So I think the year ahead and the future to come, it's a learning curve. So it's getting all the knowledge I need, learning, branding. Um, tutoring is now an industry. I think post-COVID, we need to recognise it's it's a proper industry, as they say. So it's not just a side job that you do to help out a neighbour or a family friend. But tutoring is, tutoring is a big thing now. And we need to recognise that and respect that as well. So that's the year ahead. Um, another project that I'm working on with a few teachers is I think post-COVID, it frustrates me slightly. Um, and this may not be a popular opinion, but it frustrates me slightly that on social media in particular, I feel anybody can call themselves a tutor. Whereas I think there's a certain skill set required for tutoring and knowledge and and experience. So another project I'm working on is to create a platform for teachers, sorry, not for teachers, to create a platform for parents to find a qualified tutor. So by qualified tutor, I mean someone who has experience teaching their subject, preferably in a school setting, but at least a degree in their subject. Um, just experience, because I think if you don't have that knowledge and experience, you're shortchanging parents and students, and it's not fair, quite simply. Um, so that's another project. But yeah, the year ahead, it's just about learning, really, for myself. Development. Development, completely. So, Lovely. I mean, looking at things you offer, for example, there's a lot of CPD you offer and the Tutoring wow. Association. So it's just it's just learning about this new industry that I'm working in full time. How exciting. Yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, um, you guys, listeners will be listening to this uh, just after you know Christmas, the 25th of, of December, which is, you know, if that's something that you celebrate looking ahead to the new year again, if this is the, the January is a time that you celebrate the new year. What a, a, a really exciting time, um, time to think about, you know, new changes, any changes you'd like to make to you, your tutoring or your business. I hope some of the things that Mira has been discussing here um, can inspire that. Mira, if people want to join the Facebook group or the, the website or the Facebook group, where can they do that? Sure. So the website is www.englishdepartment.co.uk and the Facebook group is searchable if you I imagine typing in English department, it should come up. If not, I think there's a link for it on the website. Awesome. Well, both of those will be in the show notes. Um, Mira, thank you so, so much uh, for coming on, for taking part in your first podcast appearance. I think it was a a, a real hit. So you should do more of these. (laughs) Um, But yeah, uh, that's been the 145th episode of the Qualified Tutor Podcast. My name has been Ludo Miller. Thank you so much to Mira Vasudeva for coming on. I hope you enjoyed talking about what you do, Mira. I did. I did. Thank you for the opportunity, Ludo. That's quite all right. Uh, and listeners, we will catch you in the new year for our fi- following episode. Um, so have a great end of the year uh, and we'll see you soon. Cheerio. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Qualified Tutor Podcast. Your next step is to check out the Love Tutoring Community, and in particular, Love Tutoring Community Connect, a new premium membership space which will serve all your subject-specific CPD needs alongside a friendly, professional community space that meets regularly. Visit qualifiedtutor.org slash transformational dash training to find out more about our CPD accredited level two safeguarding and off-qual recognized courses, the first of their kind in the tutoring industry. See you there.